Welcome to NTD News, I'm Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. A record number of children are crossing the border alone. We look at just how much it's costing U.S. taxpayers for the government to care for them. President Biden rolls out several gun control measures, but his actions are limited because more sweeping rules would have to go through Congress. What does the governor of Texas say about his constituents' gun rights? A former Major League Baseball play commissioner writes an op-ed about the league's recent actions. We hear his take on moving the All-Star game and expanding business with China. And labor organizers hope to unionize Amazon. The company's warehouse employees in Alabama hold a vote. But what are the chances of the online retail giant going union? Britain's Prince Philip, consort of Queen Elizabeth, has died aged 99, Buckingham Palace said on Friday. These were among the latest images of the Duke, a Greek prince and blunt-speaking naval officer. He and the Queen had been shielding at Windsor Castle during the pandemic. Both were vaccinated. The palace said it is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Further announcements will be made in due course. The royal family join with people around the world in mourning his loss. Though outspoken and irascible, Philip lived in the shadow of the woman he married at Westminster Abbey in 1947. He always walked a step behind his queen at the thousands of ceremonial events they attended during her reign, the longest in British history. In a rare personal tribute, the queen once called him her strength and stay. Though he had no official role, Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, was one of the most influential figures in the royal family for more than 70 years. While often criticised for his demeanour and for remarks that caused offence, those close to the family say he brought wit, impatient intelligence and unflagging energy to the monarchy. Often facing a deeply traditional court, he reformed the palace and tried to harness the growing power of television to project royal influence. He pushed for the Queen's coronation in 1953 to be televised live, and behind the scenes removed outdated behaviour in the palace he regarded as stuffy. He was the first royal to do a TV interview. The royal couple had four children, Charles, Anne, Andrew and Edward. Authorities say a record number of unaccompanied minors crossed the U.S. border in March. It surpassed the previous monthly record by over 7,000. The United States encountered a record surge of unaccompanied minors in March. Authorities said Thursday the government picked up nearly 19,000 children traveling alone across the border last month. That's about double the amount from February. We've seen the number of unaccompanied children start going up since last year when hurricanes hit Central America, when the COVID-19 pandemic caused extended lockdown. A conservative analyst, on the other hand, said Thursday President Biden's policies are to blame. Uh, remove a host of other, you know, numerous uh, immigration enforcement and border security measures, there's going to be a, a mass crisis. Um, and so I'm not surprised when we see the record setting numbers today, not, not, not in the least. March's numbers blew past the previous record of over 11,000 unaccompanied minors back in May of 2019. So how much is the record surge costing the government? The Washington Post estimates the Biden administration is spending at least $60 million per week to care for over 16,000 unaccompanied minors. That's based on government data obtained by the Washington Post. The funding amounts to $3 billion per year to house children in health and human service facilities. That's four times the amount given to the Small Business Administration to help businesses during the pandemic. The Post reports it costs about $290 per day to house a child in permanent shelters. And it's much more expensive for emergency shelters. An HHS spokesman told the outlet, based on past experience, it costs about $775 per day to care for a child in an emergency site. Teens and children spend an average of 31 days in HHS custody. So the overall cost would add up to about $24,000 per child. And that doesn't include time spent in Border Patrol custody. The number of migrants and associated costs are expected to increase dramatically in the coming months. Arizona's Attorney General said yesterday that Vice President Kamala Harris hasn't responded to his invitation to tour the border. He says the lack of response isn't fair to migrants or U.S. taxpayers who have to pay for their care. We reached out to the vice president's spokesperson and the White House for comment, but haven't heard back. Biden laid out six executive actions to combat gun violence in America. And he says much more is needed, but that would require new laws to be passed. 
We hear from an expert on what challenges Biden may face implementing his gun control agenda. On Thursday, Biden proposed several steps to curb gun violence. He calls the problem an epidemic and an international embarrassment. Biden has proposed the most ambitious gun control agenda of any modern presidential candidate. Jacob Charles is a gun expert at Duke University. He says Biden's proposed gun rules are actions he can take alone as president. They're not as sweeping as other things that he would like to do that he has said in the past he would support and that he again announced support for today. That would happen through legislation. Biden's moves crack down on homemade guns without serial numbers called ghost guns. He's also looking to regulate pistol stabilizing braces. His order stopped short of his campaign promises, though. On the campaign trail, Biden promised to ban assault weapons, give resources to the FBI and DOJ to enforce gun laws, among others. But even gun advocates acknowledge that bigger changes would need to happen in Congress. Charles speculates on what may happen in the Senate. Last time when the a Democratic administration tried to get uh, gun regulations passed in the aftermath of the Sandy Hook shooting, um, nothing happened, um, right? There was a, a big debate in the Senate and then ended up not passing, and that was when the Democrats had more senators. Texas Governor Greg Abbott publicly denounced Biden's planned actions. He's going so far as to call for state laws making Texas a Second Amendment sanctuary. Abbott is asking for a law that would defy federal gun control laws. He claims Biden's moves are a new liberal power grab to take away citizens' guns. President Biden is releasing his first budget proposal to Congress. It offers a long-awaited glimpse into his policy agenda and how he plans to confront the challenges the country faces. The $1.5 trillion budget would invest billions more in public transportation and environmental cleanups, slash funding for a border wall, and expand funding for background checks on gun sales. Each goal clashes with the previous administration's policy. The document will also request some $715 billion for the Defense Department. The White House has delayed producing the document. The administration blames resistance from political officials during the handover from Trump. It denies that competing interests over issues like military funding played a role. Biden's proposal will provide only an outline on spending for programs and departments. A full budget proposal will be submitted after this spring. Florida is the nation's cruise capital. They have three of the world's busiest ports. And now the state is suing the Biden administration to reopen the cruise industry. NTD's Christina Kim has the story. Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis said Thursday, quote, To be clear, no federal law authorizes the CDC to indefinitely impose a nationwide shutdown of an entire industry. He said this regulation is based on very little evidence and data. The lawsuit is asking the court to stop the CDC and Health and Human Services from imposing the conditional sale order. The CDC said they'd eventually reopen the cruise industry, but they'll keep the order in place for now. The CEO of Norwegian Cruise Line points out that the CDC treats similar industries differently. The CDC has shut us down for over a year now. I don't know of any other industry that uh, has suffered at the hands of any federal agency like we have. If the court doesn't undo the conditional sale order, the lawsuit says around 160,000 Floridians whose livelihoods depend on the cruise industry could lose everything. During just the first six months of the pandemic, Florida's cruise industry reportedly lost $3.2 billion in economic activity. And to date, over 6,000 former cruise employees filed for state unemployment. Del Rio says it's unfair that the cruise industry has to follow such strict requirements when others don't. Everybody on board is vaccinated. Everybody on board has to follow these science-based, very strict protocols. So the need for all this nonsense, daily reporting, do hotels report daily, do airlines report daily, no one does. Governor DeSantis notes that cruising has resumed in other countries, meaning some Americans will be on cruise ships regardless, just not out of Florida. According to the Associated Press, industry leaders say there haven't been any new outbreaks tied to their ships. DeSantis says this lawsuit is to protect Floridians from government overreach. He says he believes they have a good chance at winning the case. Christina Kim, NTD News. Boeing says it has taken legal action against a Texas-based supplier for the presidential jet Air Force One. They're also canceling the contract. That's over delays in competing interior work on the two heavily modified 747-8 planes. In July 2018, Boeing received a $3.9 billion contract to build two 747-8 aircrafts that would be used as Air Force One. GDC agreed to design and build the interior of two planes, 
but are reportedly almost a year behind schedule. Still, a Boeing spokeswoman says the jet maker plans to meet the December 2024 delivery schedule. The Boeing 747-8S are designed to be an airborne White House, able to fly in worst-case security scenarios such as nuclear war. They're modified with military avionics, advanced communications, and self-defense system. A vote to unionize Amazon warehouse workers in Alabama appears headed for failure. Votes against the union are leading by more than two to one. But that's not all. Union leaders say Amazon broke the law and they will contest the vote. About half the ballots are counted. The no votes are leading by more than a two to one majority. Both sides fought hard over the vote. Amazon posted anti-union signs throughout the warehouse. They held mandatory meetings to convince workers to vote against the union. Organizers gathered outside the warehouse. They talked to workers on their way in and out of work. The vote received national attention. Celebrities and President Joe Biden weighed in. Amazon is a big fish for labor organizers. Union membership is in decline. Amazon has almost a million workers. Labor leaders hope to spread unions throughout the company. They're also targeting the country's other mammoth retailer, Walmart. This apparent loss in Alabama deals a blow to the plans. Stuart Applebaum is president of the retail union trying to organize the Amazon workers. He says Amazon broke the law. He wants the labor board to hold Amazon accountable for its behavior during the campaign. Applebaum did not specify the allegations. Amazon did not respond to a request for comment. The union could petition for a revote. Vote counting continues on Friday in Birmingham. Reports say about 500 ballots are being contested. That could swing the vote. Whichever side gets the majority will be the winner. The Wall Street Journal reports an update in the process. The votes counted so far indicate 71% of the Amazon workers have voted against a union. A worker who voted no says she doesn't see what benefits a union would bring. A Facebook spokesperson says the company didn't notify the hundreds of millions of users whose personal data was leaked and doesn't have the intention to do so. Business Insider first reported the data leak. It included information about users' phone numbers, Facebook IDs and names, locations, emails, and birthdays. Facebook said the leak did not include financial health data or passwords. While the data appears to be several years old, this could cause valuable data hacks or prompt other mistreatment of information. Facebook has grappled with data security issues for years. In 2019, a Ukrainian security researcher found a database with the names, phone numbers, and unique user IDs of more than 267 million Facebook users on the open internet. It's unclear if the current data dump is related to the database. Professional networking site LinkedIn says it has not been hacked, even though data from about half a billion users has been posted for sale online. The company says the post was made on a website popular with hackers. But according to LinkedIn, the information was taken only from users' public profiles. Some of the data was aggregated from other websites, and the company says it did not see any private information in the post. A cybersecurity site says the information included users' names, emails, phone numbers, and professional titles. Some of that data can still be used by bad actors, including for robocall scams. Faye Vincent is a former Major League Baseball commissioner. Now he's passing on some advice to the current commissioner in an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal. Here are the details. Vincent says baseball shouldn't take sides in politics. He says Major League Baseball can't become a weapon in the culture wars, a hostage for one political party or ideology. Vincent says baseball should not be for rich or poor people. It shouldn't be for one race or another. He says baseball must always stand above politics and its dark elements of corruption, greed, and sordid selfishness. It can't go wrong by standing for national greatness. He criticizes Commissioner Robert Manfred for moving the All-Star game. He says Manfred probably made the decision without taking a close look at the election law. Vincent asked how Manfred can boycott Georgia while expanding business with a genocidal China. The U.S. has declared that China is committing genocide in Xinjiang. That declaration came under former President Trump. His administration sanctioned Chinese officials for human rights abuses against the spiritual meditation practice Falun Gong and for Beijing's crackdown on Hong Kong. 
David Wells agrees that the league is making a bad choice. He's a three-time All-Star and two-time World Series winning pitcher. He tells Fox News that he doesn't want to have anything to do with baseball now. He says baseball was his life, and it kills him to not go to games or watch. But he explains he can't condone what the league is doing. Wyoming's Governor Mark Gordon just signed a new law. It protects infants who survive abortions that go wrong. The law is called Born Alive Infant Means of Care. Now, doctors performing abortions must take steps to preserve the life and health of any viable infant that comes out of the procedure alive. The governor vetoed a similar bill last year, but his communications director says this new version is different and aligns with his pro-life and pro-family convictions. But Democratic Senate Minority Floor Leader Chris Rothfuss told The Hill the bill either does nothing or does something that would perpetuate a circumstance that would be painful to the family. The law goes into effect starting in July. And the mayor of Philadelphia is facing a lawsuit over alleged discrimination against Italian Americans. It has to do with Columbus Day. Italian American groups and a city councilman are suing Philadelphia's mayor. That's for trying to remove the legacy of Christopher Columbus from the city. They say the mayor is racially discriminating against Italian Americans. NTD's Don Tran has the details. A Philadelphia council member and several Italian American groups are suing Mayor Jim Kenney for his alleged divisive anti-Italian American discriminatory actions. The city toppled the statues of Christopher Columbus and Italian American Mayor Frank Rizzo. That's because Rizzo is accused of being a racist and pushing abusive police policies. And Columbus is accused by some of committing genocide against the indigenous people in America. This past February, the mayor replaced Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. The group says the mayor is violating the Constitution, which prohibits discrimination based on anyone's national origin. It's not equal treatment to cancel the Columbus Day holiday and replace it with some other ethnic group's holiday. In this instance, Indigenous Peoples Day. What we want to do is we want to hold him accountable for these kind of racist practices and policies. They say indigenous people should be able to celebrate their heritage. But the change creates division because it denies Italians from doing the same. Councilman Mark Squilla said the issue isn't all about Columbus. He says the mayor violated state law when he made the decision alone, without going through a process. And we just hope that if anybody you know, decides to do something like this in the future, they will include the uh, public in that process and, and making sure that uh, all views are heard before a final decision is made. And then once that decision is made, no matter what side it falls on, at least the people were included in a part of that process. And then we would have to live with it, be angry with it or move on. But we would know that it was done properly. The lawsuit was filed in a U.S. district court, and their case is meant to hopefully stop discrimination from happening again in the city. Now, who knows which community is going to be next, which ethnic group is going to be next for him to attack. At the very least, the lawsuit seeks to repeal the name change to Columbus Day. Philadelphia's mayor said in a statement he can't comment further at this time. Don Tran, NTD News. Reservations will be a must again for people headed to Yosemite National Park this summer. The National Park Service says reservations will be mandatory from May 21st through the end of September. The goal is to manage the number of visitors and reduce pandemic risks. The National Park already had a temporary reservation system from last June through October and again in February this year. Visitors who make reservations will get a daily pass, which will be valid for three days. It will apply to one vehicle and all of its occupants. Millions of visitors flock to the National Park in California every year to enjoy its pristine natural beauty. This year, there won't be a cherry blossom parade on Constitution Avenue in D.C., but enthusiasts have come up with a way to keep the tradition alive. Neighborhoods across the Washington, D.C. area will be part of the new Petal Porch Parade. Residents can decorate their homes with cherry blossom arts and crafts. We just want to make sure that, you know, we can bring the cherry blossoms to the community. If, if people weren't comfortable going down to the Tidal Basin, we want to make sure that people still get to celebrate the, the greatest celebration of springtime with the National Cherry Blossom Festival this year. The festival committee selected 10 local artists to design and paint 10 cars with a cherry blossom springtime theme. The artists have been painting the cars throughout the week at the University of the District of Columbia. 
my design was selected. My, it's called Spring is in the Air. And it's going to be, this minivan is going to be covered with kites because kite flying seems like springtime to me. This weekend, the procession will drive by homes across the D.C. area. The parade is part of a three-week-long festival celebrating spring. This year's National Independence Day parade in Washington, D.C. is canceled. The Park Service says many of the high school bands and drill teams involved can't travel due to the pandemic. They also haven't had enough time to rehearse and fundraise for the event. The National Park Service says the parade should be back next year. And still to come, a Los Angeles parking lot becomes a real-life candy land. The sugar-themed attraction is welcoming both kids and adults as pandemic restrictions ease. And astronauts spoke to Earthside students in outer space. They chatted about the view from the International Space Station and what has changed on Earth from the astronauts' perspective. Find out more on NTD News. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us, then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense going on inside the banking system. I mean, we've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008, and it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, while simple folks like you and me, we're only getting the short end of the stick. That's why I'm glad I found this book called The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever, just one American to another, telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call 866-239-2619 today for your free copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's 866-239-2619. Ninety percent of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. One theme park in L.A. is offering a brand new experience for visitors, especially for those with a sweet tooth. The attraction transformed a parking lot into a sugar-themed delight. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. Families are enjoying a unique new walkthrough experience in Los Angeles. This candy-themed attraction is called Sugar Rush and features giant lollipops, cupcakes, and other sweets. We like to say that Sugar Rush is Burning Man and Willy Wonka getting together for a radical spin-off, and that's what you have here, where you have the really unique and abstract art installations. We also deliver on our promise of candy fun. It's here. Originally designed as a drive through the theme park was transformed into an immersive walking experience with luminous unicorns, giraffes, kangaroos, and mirrored corridors. I'm in love with this place. The, the minute I stepped in here, I felt like I'm having a sugar rush without eating any sugar. 350 gallons of brightly colored paint were used to transform a 50,000 square foot parking lot attached to the Woodland Hills Westfield Shopping Arcade. In order to comply with health and safety guidelines, visitors enjoy the sights while walking along a one-way route. There's also a no candy rule in the park. That's to prevent people taking their masks off. Instead, Candy is handed out to visitors as they leave. Even though it doesn't have rides, it's really fun to be in here because there's, there's things look like candy but massive and it makes them like want to eat it. The experience was designed to delight both kids and adults. You know, it's easy to put a smile on a kid's face, colors, shiny things, but really we want mom, dad, brother, sister that are a little older 
to come here and really enjoy and think this was something different and that it was curated not just for the little ones but also for them and they might pick up on some of those items that are here. Sugar Rush is expected to run until May 2nd. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Good news for superhero fans. The new Avengers Campus is set to open at Disney's California Adventure this summer. The attraction, based on the Marvel franchise, is Disneyland's latest undertaking at its Parks and Resorts unit. Disney said on Thursday the land will open June 4th, a few months after Disneyland itself reopens on April 30th. Disneyland and California Adventure have been closed for more than a year because of the pandemic. The new Avengers Campus will include rides, food, and locales, all based on the comic book brand. Its premier attraction is called Web Slingers, a Spider-Man adventure, which is a 3D ride with New York's favorite web slinger. Two NASA astronauts spoke with a group of students gathered from around the world. The young minds are studying at the Space Institute, while the astronauts are floating miles above in orbit. Floating on board the International Space Station, NASA astronauts Shannon Walker and Kate Rubens took questions from the young minds of the Space Institute. The students were from Houston, Scotland, and Ecuador, and asked the astronauts what it's like to go to space. My question for NASA is, how do you mentally and physically prepare for a long-term space mission? Um, you just need to be ready, and everybody prepares for that differently. Physically, you've got to be in shape to be able to do spacewalks, to be able to take the loads of launching and landing. And so we actually work with athletic trainers before we leave uh, Earth to make sure we're in the best physical shape we can be before we get up here. My question is, could a disease ever evolve in space and could it reach the Earth? But it's very unlikely that any new viruses would evolve up here because we don't have any other people besides the few that are up here and we don't have any animals. And that's really how viruses evolve uh, on Earth and that's how they transmit on Earth. They also asked them how the pandemic changed what the planet looked like from space. Rubin said she did notice some changes. And we have noticed, um, you know, if you look at, at things like commercial air travel, uh, very early on, the number of, of flights going across, we can see the trails that the airplanes leave. That's reduced, and then some of the lights in the city are reduced because of the pandemic. The two astronauts said they took part in the online event because they think it's incredibly important to get young people involved in space science. Around 200 miles above Earth, the International Space Station is the place to be. And that's where this rocket is headed. Check it out. So use MS-18 on its way to the International Space Station. Early this morning, two cosmonauts from the Russian Space Agency and one NASA astronaut launched into space. It's a speedy trip to the space station with two orbits of Earth and about three hours of travel time. Their arrival will bring the total number of crew members on the station to 10 people. They'll be working on multiple experiments there, including studies about Alzheimer's disease and portable ultrasound devices. And just ahead, the Chinese regime is mandating every theater to show at least two propaganda movies per week, but those films are suffering low ticket sales. And a tragedy strikes in China over a failed GPS system. A truck driver there committed suicide after receiving a $300 traffic fine. It was the final straw following years of driver mistreatment. That and more on NTD News. On Friday, Iran released a South Korean ship and its captain that were detained since January. This is after South Korea promised to try to secure the release of Iranian funds frozen in their banks. The South Korean tanker ship and its captain that were detained by Iran in January have now been freed, after South Korea promised to try and release Iranian funds that have been frozen in South Korean banks because of U.S. sanctions. That's according to a South Korean government source. The tanker was seized in the Strait of Hormuz off Oman by Iranian authorities, who had accused it of polluting the waters with chemicals. A diplomatic emergency arose when, separately, Tehran was demanding that Seoul release $7 billion in frozen funds. Twenty crew members except the captain were released in February after a South Korean delegation visited Iran. Both South Korean Foreign Ministry statement and Iranian state news agencies' report on the ship did not mention the demand for the release of funds. 
The news also comes as Iran and United States have begun informal talks this week over salvaging the 2015 nuclear deal. Iran has denied allegations that the seizure of the tanker and its crew constituted hostage taking, saying it was South Korea that was holding Iranian funds hostage. A truck driver in China was fined $300 simply because his GPS system got disconnected. The driver ended his own life when authorities failed to understand it wasn't his fault. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more on the story. A $300 fine marked the final straw for a truck driver in northern China. The man committed suicide earlier this week. Driver Jing Dechiang drove through a trucker's checkpoint during his route on Monday. Their inspector said his Beidou navigation system, or BDS, got disconnected. The satellite GPS system is mandatory for all truck drivers in the country. So they detained his truck and gave him a $300 ticket. Jing tried to explain the disconnect wasn't his fault, but authorities paid little mind. Having reached the end of his rope, Jing purchased a highly toxic pesticide from a nearby store and ended his life. He left a suicide note explaining what pushed him over the edge. Jing wrote that he was 51. He has been a hard-working truck driver for 10 years, but earned little. He also often got sick and had health problems, but still had to keep working. He reiterated that it's not the driver's fault when the BDS disconnects and noted that the quality of the system has proved a nightmare for truck drivers. He wrote, it's not that my life isn't worth $300. I do this to speak out for the majority of truck drivers. I hope my death will spark leaders' attention on this matter. He drank the pesticide while inside a corridor near the inspector's office area, but he wasn't sent to the hospital until the last moment of his life. His brother later learned that Jing had posted a video on a truck driver chatting group. In the clip, Jing said it had been 10 minutes since he drank the pesticide, but that no one took notice. His brother also discovered later that there's only $900 in Jing's bank account. Information surrounding Jing's death has caught the public eye online. Under pressure from public opinion, officials confirmed that it did happen, claiming that related departments are investigating and will update. Many netizens are voicing outrage that officials hand out tickets and fines for minor offenses. One user posted, the regime has to keep a bunch of thugs in order to expand its power. Its financial resources are sustained by these fines. The BDS navigation system was developed in China, designed as global competition to American-made GPS systems. It's widely believed that the Chinese Communist Party aims to use it to reduce its dependence on GPS, especially for its military. On the roads, any driver who fails to install the system won't be granted a trucking operating license. Drivers also have to pay heavy installation fees and annual maintenance fees in order to access it. If a trucker is found to have disconnected from the system, they can face fines of up to nearly $800. Another online user commented on the related technical problems, saying if the BDS system got disconnected, it's the BDS that needs to compensate the drivers, not the opposite. These drivers are really hardworking. This world is no longer for humans. It's the devil's world. An article posted online notes that instead of saying safe trip or drive safe, Chinese truck drivers often remind each other to check their BDS connections before departing. The CCP is re-releasing about eight propaganda movies to celebrate its anniversary this year. But Chinese moviegoers don't seem to be very excited about them. According to China's box office ranking, those propaganda movies, or red movies, are one of the worst in terms of ticket sales. Two of them appeared at the bottom of a list of almost 200 films screened this year. The rest don't even show up because not enough people have watched them. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the CCP's founding. The regime is reportedly mandating public screenings of red movies. Each theater in China has to play at least two red movies per week. Theater owners can choose from 12 of them. Most of the movies were filmed decades ago. One of the 12 red films portrays Chinese communist soldiers fighting against the U.S. in the Korean War. What it doesn't say is that the communist side lost over 2 million soldiers during the Korean War. The film also claims the U.S. supported the so-called South Korean invasion of communist North Korea. But historians widely believe it was the Soviet Union-backed North Korea that invaded South Korea. 
In the meantime, Chinese authorities delayed the re-release of the Lord of the Rings series and said many theaters will show red movies. One Chinese netizen wrote, Garbage is just garbage. It'll never turn into gold. Many Chinese fans of the Lord of the Rings series are disappointed that they have to wait longer now. On the other hand, a new Hollywood film, Godzilla vs. Kong, became a blockbuster in China. Its ticket revenue has reached the equivalent of over $150 million as of Wednesday. It's now one of the top five this year. Soon, we see police clash with protesters in Northern Ireland. It's part of a week of protests related to Brexit trade restrictions. The U.S. State Department responds. Imperial jewelry pieces, once owned by Napoleon's adopted daughter, go up for auction. It comes 200 years after the French ruler's death. Find out more on NTD News. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explained life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-509-8500. Coventry Direct, redefining insurance. We can't control political volatility, inflation, massive government debt, or the wild swings of the stock market. But we can control where we put our money. Gold is easily outperforming the stock market the last 20 years. Protect your money. Buy gold. For your free direct bullion guide to buying gold, call 1-800-757-7050. During the 2008 recession, Americans lost over $2 trillion from their 401ks. For many people, retirement was no longer an option. But do you know what tried and true investment nearly doubled its value following the recession? Gold. Protect your money. Buy gold. For your free direct bullion guide to buying gold, call 1-800-757-7050. Start your collection today. Over to Europe, there's more trouble in Northern Ireland after a crowd of young people attacked police with petrol bombs and stones in an Irish nationalist area of Belfast on Thursday, and police responded with water cannons. The U.S. has expressed concern about renewed violence in Northern Ireland after another night of unrest. A crowd of young people Thursday evening threw petrol bombs and stones at Belfast police who responded with water cannons. A week of violence has injured 55 police officers and seen boys as young as 13 arrested on rioting charges. U.S. State Department spokesman Ned Price. As the United Kingdom and the EU implement Brexit-related provisions, uh, this administration encourages them to prioritize political and economic stability in Northern Ireland. The violence is fueled in part by frustration among pro-British unionists over post-Brexit trade barriers. Unionists say the so-called Northern Ireland Protocol amounts to a border in the Irish Sea, and they feel cut off and betrayed by London. There's also anger about the failure to prosecute members of the Irish Nationalist Party Sinn Féin, who allegedly breached lockdown rules when they attended the funeral of a former IRA member in June last year. In turn, Sinn Féin has accused the pro-British Democratic Unionist Party, or DUP, of stoking tensions by opposing new trading barriers. Both parties put their differences aside on Thursday to condemn the violence. Washington joined in support of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, which ended decades of violence. Much of Northern Ireland remains deeply split among sectarian lines, 23 years after the Good Friday deal. 
Many Catholic nationalists aspire to unify with Ireland, while Protestant unionists want to stay in the UK. Burma's ambassador to the UK urged the British government not to recognize the junta's envoy and to send them back after he was locked out of the embassy by the representatives of the military. NTD's Neil Woodrow has more. I'm outside the Burmese embassy in London where around 50 protesters have been calling for democracy and for the military attaché inside to get out. On Wednesday, Kuo Min, Burma, also known as Myanmar's ambassador to the UK, was locked out of his embassy by military attaché and had to spend the night in his car. The ambassador said through a spokesman that after the military coup in February, he was recalled by the military regime. Since then, he has stopped following Burma's foreign ministry's instructions. There was a coup in Myanmar in February, now in a similar situation in central London. UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab condemned the bullying actions of the military regime and paid tribute to the ambassador's courage. The ambassador, through his spokesman, is standing defiant. Yes, we have full faith in the UK government not to recognize the military council of Myanmar and not to follow the military council request to install Dr. Chewin as the Chengdi uh, affair, but to stand with the democratically elected government of Myanmar and its people. In a letter to the British Foreign Ministry from the Myanmar Embassy seen by Reuters, those in control of the embassy said that Deputy Ambassador Chit Win had taken over as charge d'affaires as of Wednesday. The BBC reports that the UK has accepted the changes. Outside the embassy, protesters are calling for the UK government to help them and chanting slogans, stop killing our people right now, right now, China gains, Burma pays. One protester from Burma says it's unacceptable that their country's embassy is seized by the military. We are quite afraid that if this military attaché successfully seized the army's embassy in UK, the similar situation is going to happen in different countries because, you know, it is like a coup in a central land. Yeah. Thant tells NTD most Burmese believe China secretly supports the junta and provides IT technicians and workforce to the military. After the military coup earlier this year, Kuo Min called for Burma's ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi to be released. Since the military coup, over 600 anti-coup demonstrators have been killed, according to some Burma media. The protesters say they hope the situation can be turned around for the future of all Burmese. Neil Woodrow, NTD News, London. As the UK government reviews the idea of a pass that would prove your COVID-19 status, there's concerns fraudsters may advertise fake ones. Here's NTD's Jane Worrell with more. With cyber fraud on the rise since pandemic restrictions, concerns that fraudsters may start forging vaccine certificates. The government hasn't confirmed whether a domestic passport scheme will be launched in the UK, but it's piloting the idea at some large events. You've got to be very careful in how you handle this and, and don't uh, start a system that's, that's uh, discriminatory. Um, but obviously we're looking at it. The Prime Minister said that domestic vaccine passports won't be introduced on April the 12th or May the 17th. Those are the next reopening dates. But he certainly hasn't ruled it out. Michael Gove is currently reviewing the idea. Meanwhile, the banking trade body says that scammers are likely to adapt their ways and may start targeting people by advertising fake COVID certificates. The passes could prove a challenge to authenticate. There are essentially three points at which it can go wrong. It might not be the person who's been tested. It might not be the person who owns the certificate and the certificate in in itself might be entirely fake. But he says proving the authenticity of certificates could come in a way that compromises other freedoms. I think at the very deepest level, um, to get this to get this working perfectly, you need a complete biometric based uh, identity system working. That's an enormous cost to society. Uh, It means it means that you would introduce uh, uh, you would you know who who is who is whom from from facial recognition or something like that at any point in any place slightly more authoritarian governments uh, would be would be inclined to abuse these systems once they're in place some have suggested younger people wanting to go to large events may be a target for scammers fraud experts have cautioned people if vaccine certificates are introduced to get them from an official source jane Warrell, ntd news london 
A jewelry collection once owned by Napoleon's daughter will go on sale at an auction in Switzerland. The auction house calls it a once-in-a-lifetime sale. Christie's Geneva will be holding an auction on May 12th. They are selling nine imperial jewelry pieces once owned by Napoleon Bonaparte's adopted daughter. The pieces include a tiara, earrings, pendants, and a bracelet. They will be offered as individual lots. The jewels were shown to the media in Amsterdam earlier this week. The auction takes place at a moment of historical significance. 2021 marks the year of 200 years of Napoleon's death, and I imagine that the family decided this was a good point in, in history to part from these jewels who have been in the, in the family for so many generations. The jewels originally belonged to Stephanie de Beauharnais, the Grand Duchess of Baden. Napoleon married Stephanie's aunt in 1796. He later adopted Stephanie after her mother died. Well, I think in, in jewelry history, Napoleon is probably one of the most important provenances you can find. So it's, it's a very rare occasion that important pieces of that kind come to auction in the first place. And then to have that amazing provenance on top of it, it's, it's, it only happens once in a lifetime. Christie's is counting a total of 38 natural sapphires in the Beauharnais Peruri. They all came from what is now Sri Lanka with no further treatment. The collection also features an unknown number of diamonds. It's very tough to say the exact number of diamonds, but we're basically in the thousands of diamonds. And each diamond would have been cut perfectly for this piece and for this design. So you find very different sizes, cuts and styles. The auction house will not disclose the name of the seller, but the pieces are coming from descendants of the royal family. One highlight of the collection is the crown of Portuguese Queen Maria II. It's set with a remarkable Burmese sapphire in the center. What do you call a group of jellyfish? Residents in the northern Italian port town of Triste found out on Wednesday when a smack of jellyfish floated into the harbor there. Local residents took to social media to show their array of video and pictures of the grouping, which experts say was made up of barrel jellyfish. It's one of the biggest to be found in the Mediterranean Sea. Environmental groups said the unusual gathering was probably caused by particular winds and currents that had pushed the jellyfish into the harbor. They remained on top of the water where the temperatures were warmer and where they would find more plankton. And still to come, climbing will soon make its debut at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. The U.S. team describes the exciting lead-up and what the sports entry into the Games means to them. All that and more on NTD News. The Tokyo Olympics are set for this summer, and a new event may make its mark on the Games. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. Team USA's Olympic climbers are ready for their debut on the world stage. For these young athletes, it's a dream come true. Yeah, uh, I've always been a huge Olympic fan, and so, you know, we didn't grow up with the dream of climbing being in the Olympics uh, because it wasn't there yet. And so when it did become a reality, it absolutely was, you know, my goal. Um, and like Nathaniel, I wasn't sure how much of a reality it is. And so now to be sitting here with a full team, uh, you know, four athletes going, I think that's really cool. For the first time, climbing will be part of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. But I think also just the fact that climbing is in the Olympics really suits the like Olympic motto in general, like Sidious Altius Fortius is higher, faster, stronger, and it really relates to, to climbing. I think higher is lead climbing, faster is speed climbing, and stronger is bouldering. So it's, it's just kind of cool that there's that relation to that. Though they'll have to wait until next year to compete as the games were postponed because of the pandemic. Team USA will be sending four young climbers, two from Salt Lake City, Utah, 24-year-olds Nathaniel Coleman and Kyra Condi, and two from Boulder, Colorado, 19-year-old Brooke Robitou and 17-year-old Colin Duffy. Um, bouldering and lead climbing are based on difficulty and speed climbing is based on time. And then pretty simply stated, they will just multiply your scores from each event individually, and the lowest score win. Climbing will feature three categories, lead, speed, and bouldering. The Olympic Games will run from July 23rd through August 8th. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Four-time gold medalist gymnast Simone Biles might be going to France. 
She hints she may compete in the 2024 Paris Olympics. She says her French coaches are pushing her to get involved. Because Cecile and Laurent are from Paris, and so they've kind of guilted me into at least being a specialist and coming back. But, you know, the main goal is 2021 Olympics first tour, and then we'll have to see. Biles is the winner of the coveted all-round crown, along with team, floor, and vault gold medals at the 2016 Rio Olympics. Biles gave every indication that the upcoming Tokyo Games would be her last Olympics. But during her appearance at the Team USA Virtual Media Summit, the 24-year-old hinted that she might put off retirement and try to compete in Paris in an individual event. She says after the Tokyo Games, she and other female gymnasts will tour America. Then she will decide if or how she'll be involved with the Paris Games in 2024. You may think that staying slim and eating healthfully means no sweets. But there are natural and delicious sweeteners that won't wreck your diet. Some even even have therapeutic side benefits. Welcome to Strong Mind and Body, I'm Gina Marie. Despite this obsessive focus on what to eat, Americans are larger and unhealthier than ever before. In 2016, two-thirds of the adult population were considered overweight, according to a US Department of Health and Human Services study. One factor that is contributing to America's growing problem with weight is our addiction to sugar. What passes for sugar these days is actually a hyper-sweetened extract of one of the cheapest, most heavily sprayed GMO-pervasive crops on the planet. Corn syrup has become the go-to agent for sweetening processed foods. Due to its low cost, government subsidies and high concentration. Wonder what your options are when only something sweet will do? Nature has got you covered. Here are four solutions for satisfying your sweet tooth that won't rot your teeth, spike your blood sugar and increase your weight. In fact, these natural wonders even pack some amazing health benefits. Xylitol. Xylitol is a naturally occurring sugar alcohol that's derived from birch bark. Sweet like sugar but with only 40% of the calories. Xylitol is fast becoming the choice of health conscious consumers. Low carb dieters will find xylitol appealing. It has less than a quarter of the carbohydrates found in cane sugar. It also stands apart from synthetic sweeteners thanks to its natural origins. Stevia. Stevia is 300 times sweeter than sugar but without the caloric content. The stevia plant has been used by native people to sweeten food and drink for centuries. Stevia's popularity as a modern sugar substitute grew in the 1990s and new research confirms that the plant provides a safe, affordable and tasty alternative to expensive and potentially dangerous sweeteners. Raw honey. Identified as containing more than 181 health-promoting substances, honey converts the vital healing energy of plants into a medium that is perfect for human consumption. Rich in phytonutrients, raw honey is renowned worldwide for having powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Raw unfiltered honey is very different from the pasteurized product you find in most grocery stores. Nearly all commercially processed honey is heated. Unfortunately, this process also kills the vital living enzymes and good bacteria, which make raw honey one of the world's oldest known superfoods. Molasses. Blackstrap molasses, known to sugar refiners as final molasses, refers to the thick brown syrup that is the end result of boiling sugarcane during the production of table sugar. What sets molasses apart from cane sugar, besides the obvious appearance, is its high nutritional value. Blackstrap molasses contains more than a quarter of your daily supply of vital minerals such as iron, magnesium, potassium, manganese and B vitamins. These four healthful alternatives to sugar prove that craving a taste of sweetness doesn't have to cause cavities, promote weight gain or lead to blood sugar imbalances. On the contrary, when we look to nature, we find natural foods which actually sweeten our health as well as our palates. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan.
have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.